January 8, 1944. This week, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt holds his State of the Union address. On the topic of discussions with the other leaders of the Allied Great Powers, he says that, of course, we made some commitments. We most certainly committed ourselves to very large and very specific military plans which require the use of all Allied forces to bring about the defeat of our enemies at the earliest possible time. But there were no secret treaties or political or financial commitments. The one supreme objective for the future, which we discussed for each nation individually and for all the United Nations, can be summed up in one word, security. If that was only true for all the United Nations allies, especially Poland. This week, the Red Army enters Eastern Poland and the Polish government in exile correctly suspects that this might not only be good news. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last week, as 1943 turned into 1944, the RAF air raids over Berlin resumed while newly announced Supreme Commander to the Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe, General Dwight Eisenhower, announced a more lenient handling of the invasion of occupied Italy. In Kalmykia, the Russian SFSR, 93,000 of the Kalmyk ethnic minority were deported to Siberia on order by de facto dictator of the USSR, Josef Stalin. Many of the deported will die from the harsh conditions of the journey. The U.S. Senate and White House took steps towards a continuation of the United Nations alliance to preserve peace and stability in the world after victory had been achieved. In occupied Yugoslavia, the Wehrmacht again failed to destroy Tito's partisans, but captured a strategically important position in the Adriatic. The failed anti-partisan Operation Schneesturm now segues into the tactically more conventional Operation Waldrausch. The partisans hold positions that threaten the Axis supply and communication lines from Bosnia to the Dalmatian coast. More specifically, the lines from Slavonsky Brod to Konjic. The shift in tactic is to attack these positions straight on and take them, rather than trying to flush out and encircle Tito's forces. Obviously, Tito hasn't gotten any memo announcing that change. His headquarters in Jaitse assesses that the advancing German and Croat forces are once again making a surrounding move, so they evacuate their positions and flee east. The winter weather soon complicates the Axis effort, slowing down the advance and disrupting communication, aggravating an already troubling lack of supplies and weapons. Tito's forces, on the other hand, are relatively well-equipped with looted weapons or materials supplied by Allied airdrops. They know the area well and can move rapidly and discreetly. With the Axis forces slowed and weakened, the partisans, using these guerrilla tactics, are able to pin down the numerically superior enemy units. The battle will go on for many weeks, but details of the single encounters and movements are scarce. What is clear is that whenever the Germans will capture and clear a position, set up a holding force and move on to the next fight, the partisans will often recapture the position within days or a fortnight. Ultimately, by the end of the operation on February 14th, the German-led forces will have managed to reopen most of the vital roads and railway lines, but a decisive victory over the partisans will remain out of reach. Tito's men and women will continue harassing the positions of the occupiers and collaborators, forcing them to spend their forces holding on by their teeth. Remember how in July 1943, Benito Mussolini was ousted from power by a 19 to 8 vote by the Grand Council of Fascism. On the morning of January 8, 1944, in the Castelvecchio di Verona, six of these 19 stand trial in a special tribunal. Among the defendants are former fascist leaders like Giovanni Marinelli, Luciano Gottardi, and Carlo Pareschi, as well as Marshal of Italy Emilio Do Bono and former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Mussolini's son-in-law, Count Galeazzo Ciano. All of them, as well as a number of fascists who are tried in absentia, are charged with treason. Reportedly, Count Ciano denies all charges, crying out that, I may have made a mistake, but do not accuse me of treason. 
that is in vain because the trial is held by a kangaroo court with a foregone conclusion, except for Tullio Cianetti, who wrote an apology letter to Mussolini and is sentenced to 30 years in prison. All of the defendants present during the trial are sentenced to death. In two days, on January 10th, they will be executed by firing squad next to the Verona prison. Now, this event has a remarkable side story. A few weeks ago, Ciano's wife, Edda, Mussolini's daughter, made a move to save her husband from what was clearly inevitable death. She pleaded with her father to no avail. She then recruited the help of two other women, a Nazi German spy and an Italian prominent banker's daughter. The spy had been sent by the Germans to get her hands on and destroy Ciano's extensive diary that details a whole slew of Axis war crimes and essential strategic secrets. The three women grew close and found that they were all, how should I say it? Well, they had had enough of the Nazi and fascist Commedia dell'arte. So when faced with the impossibility of saving Ciano, they came up with another plan. Get his diary and give it to the British or American. You'll have to wait for a special episode in Astrid series Spies and Ties to see how that goes. And while Italian fascists kill Italian fascists, famine is still killing people in Bengal, British India. Viceroy Archibald Wavell's relief operations to redistribute rice using 15,000 soldiers, his ban on rice exports from the province, and the effort to import more food have not had the hoped effect. That has, however, gone largely unnoticed by the government and the press. The popular Indian newspaper, The Statesman, publishes a review of the bygone year and concludes that the Bengal famine of 1943 is not something that continues in 1944. That's not quite the full picture. Freda Bedi is sent out to report in the Bengal countryside on behalf of the Punjab Tribune and offers a different perspective. Look into the faces of the middle class and the poor. Some of them have got a haunted look. They are thinner. Tell me, I said to one, is the famine over, at least the worst of it? Good God, no, was the reply. They have only made Calcutta more comfortable for the rich to live in. They have pushed the inconvenient sites back into the villages. With continued famine, diseases like malaria, cholera, and smallpox are also endemic. Even at government-run kitchens, people are only getting up to 800 calories a day, a third of the promised rations. In the north, what is being dubbed the cotton famine also continues, and the army reports that people were dying not on account of lack of food, but on account of the weather, because they had nothing to put on, no blankets and no clothes. So perhaps the Bengal famine of 1943 is indeed over, but the Bengal famine of 1944 began as soon as it ended. What is also far from over is the German Nazi-led genocide. At Auschwitz, the SS reports show that in the last month of 1943, 8,931 female and 5,748 male prisoners died. 4,247 of the women and an unknown number of the men were selected for murder in the gas chambers. It does not include the murders on arrival or reported on as they happened. While no new transports arrived this week. Another 144 people stricken by the ongoing typhus epidemic in the camp are murdered by gas after selection in Auschwitz II Birkenau. And so, in over 1,000 camps all over the territories held by the Nazi German Reich, this week the horror of everyday life continues. But that territory is shrinking, and shrinking quickly. On January 4th, the Red Army reaches the pre-war Polish-Soviet border. They have yet to enter the parts of Poland they themselves invaded and occupied in 1939. Now, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and US President Franklin Roosevelt have already more or less agreed with Stalin that these lands in eastern Poland shall become part of the Ukrainian SSR after victory. The Polish government in exile do not know this, but they have no illusions about Stalin's general intent for Poland. With the Soviet liberation of the most eastern Polish villages just days away, the Polish government in exile releases a preemptive statement. In their victorious struggle against the German invader, the Soviet forces are reported to have crossed the frontier of Poland. The fact is another proof of the breaking down of the German resistance, and it foreshadows the inevitable military defeat of Germany. It fills the Polish nation with hope that the hour of liberation is drawing near. 
The Polish forces have been fighting ceaselessly in the air, at sea, and on land, side by side with our allies. There is no front on which Polish blood has not been mingled with the blood of other defenders of freedom. There is no country in the world where Poles did not contribute to furthering the common cause. The Polish nation is therefore entitled to expect full justice and redress as soon as it will be set free of enemy occupation. The first condition of such justice is the earliest re-establishment of Polish sovereign administration in the liberated territories of the Republic of Poland and the protection of life and property of Polish citizens. The Polish government expects that the Soviet Union, sharing its view as to the importance of future friendly relations between the two countries in the interest of peace and with the view to preventing a German revenge, will not fail to respect the rights and interests of the Polish Republic and of its citizens. Now. Despite the diplomatically phrased but rather clear concerns they express here about continued sovereignty, the government in exile now directs all Polish resistance fighters to cooperate with the Soviets and collaboratively fight against the German occupiers. Geopolitically, liberation or not, the arrival of the Red Army is for many individuals newfound hope. Alex Levine fled into the Polish woods when the Rukitno ghetto was liquidated and its inhabitants were shot in the fall of 1942. He will recall the moments the Red Army came into the forest. Finally, on January 6, 1944, the Red Army liberated Rukitno and began to pursue the Nazis to the west. Those of us who had survived were like wounded animals. We had a hard time adjusting to the idea that we'd have to leave the forest. Our daily sufferings had created a bond between us in the depths of the Polisi woods. We had learned to live in the safety of the woods, but now we had to learn the horrible reality of our family and community's fate. We left our dugout home in the woods and headed into the unknown. Sergeant Major took me to Boris Markovich Krupkin, who was in charge of the Red Army Field Hospital No. 2408 of the 13th Army of the 1st Ukrainian Front. A short, stout man with a wide forehead, Krupkin listened to the sergeant major's retelling of our story and ordered that I be taken to the army bathhouse immediately and washed and clothed with a suitable uniform until my own fitted uniform was ready. That's how I became the so-called son of the regiment, a recruit of the field hospital and officially an orphan. I was 11 years old. Never forget. Thank you.